Pixar is probably the most famous 3D animation studio in existence, and that is well-deserved. With a career that's lasted 35 years and counting, Pixar has produced some of the greatest family movies ever, which is a unique market that's different from just kids' movies. Family movies can not only be enjoyed by everyone, but can also have impactful messages that move the audience, no matter what stage of life that the viewer is currently in. This is what separates Pixar from Disney in my opinion, but make no mistake, Pixar ain't perfect. Just like Disney, they produce timeless masterpieces, as well as <laughs> embarrassing duds. And it's our job to separate the good from the bad. Hey guys, I'm Brad with Wicked Bench, and this is Pixar Movies, Worst to Best. This is probably self-explanatory, but the criteria for a film to make the list is that it must be feature-length, released in theaters, and fully produced by Pixar Animation Studios. For this ranking, we'll be checking out the plot, the characters, the dialogue, how well the setting is used, and depending on when the movie came out, if it has stood the test of time or aged like milk. Also, this video will contain spoilers for every single Pixar movie currently released. With that out of the way, let's start off with the worst movie from Pixar. Normally, the slot for worst Pixar movies goes to one of three options, and for this list, we're gonna be predictable. And place Cars 2 at number 24. Who thought it was a good idea to, one, make a sequel to the first Cars, two, turn that sequel into a spy thriller instead of a racing movie, and three, make Mater the main character? Because I can tell you right now, none of those ideas panned out well at all. The first Cars movie is undoubtedly the worst of Pixar's early days and did not set up for this kind of sequel. Also, I don't think people talk enough about how awful of a concept a car spy movie is. When I think of spies, I think of people sneaking around enemy bases, using gadgets, picking off bad guys silently, and working from the shadows, just like the good old days of Team Fortress 2. All right, what I don't think of is machines with loud engines, conspicuous designs, and no hands doing those same type of things. So how did the writers remedy this issue? By stuffing all those iconic gadgets into their front wheels, of course. But this leads into another problem one of the biggest sins a movie like this can commit, and that is not utilizing the world that you've built. We're gonna be bringing up this point a lot, but creating a fantasy world that is so far removed from the one we know and then essentially treating it as if it was just normal everyday Earth is so boring. In fairness, I'm not really sure how much you can do with this concept anyway. It seems like all roads lead to the same place with this franchise, and that's not a car pun. The spy plot is so directionless and meandering that it's confusing to remember anything about it, let alone talk about it. I can, however, describe why Mater does not belong anywhere near the main character role. Lightning McQueen is not the best protagonist, but Mater has about as much depth as a puddle, and his only likability from the first movie came from that he said and did silly and amusing things sometimes. He bonded with Lightning by showing him how he takes the simpler things in life for granted, and he needs to slow down and live more in the moment. But this movie shoves Mater into the spotlight, gives him some weird inferiority complex to overcome, and then turns him into this world-class spy who saves the world from some evil oil tycoon. I'm sorry, but Larry the Cable Guy is not capable of having serious character dialogue. That's probably the most common set of criticisms for this movie. But while he is annoying, Mater isn't actually the worst Pixar protagonist. That honor goes to the main character of the number 23 spot, Brave. This film has a lot of issues, but Merida is undoubtedly the biggest one. She's selfish and does not take responsibility for all the trouble she causes, of her own volition by the way, which makes her unlikable and hard to relate to. There is a difference between a character taking an action that makes sense but has unforeseen consequences that cause conflict later in the story, and a character making an obviously bad decision so that a plot can happen, and Brave Story does the latter. Eleanor is visibly sick after eating the cake Merida gave her, and Merida takes no issue with the fact that she may have just poisoned her mother and continues to blame her for the spell going wrong until the end of the movie. None of the side characters are entertaining, all attempts at humor fail, and no offense to Scotland, but the environments aren't nice to look at. The brightest color in this movie is the red on Merida's hair. If you want a better version of this type of story, go watch Mulan. The original, not, not the remake. Pixar has a lot of strengths, including well-written characters, humorous dialogue, entertaining plots, and Brave is devoid of all of those aspects. Seriously, watch any other Pixar movie besides this one, except Cars 2. 
Number 22 goes to the good dinosaur. Remember earlier when we talked about not utilizing your setting properly? Well, this Pixar film is by far the most guilty of this. I mean, what's cooler than dinosaurs? They're giant, scaled, feathered lizards that can be anything from enormous land predators to terrifying sea monsters to intelligent pack hunters and even flying death machines. Sauropods, like Arlo and his family, are badass creatures that can one-shot a T-Rex with a swing of their neck or tail. But with that being said, how are the dinosaurs in this movie depicted? Well, they may as well just be humans in the old American West. They farm crops just like humans, they herd cattle just like humans, they steal cattle just like humans, and the actual humans in this movie are the equivalent of wild dogs. That's all this movie is, an Old West story about a farm boy and a wild dog. You could remove the prehistoric dinosaur factor and lose almost nothing, I guess with the exception being the pterodactyls wanting to hunt and eat spot. But while I think this is a major problem that taints the film, some people may consider that a surface-level criticism. So let's talk about what actually happens in the plot. The conflict starts when a seemingly wise and sensible character, Henry, kinda does something stupid, taking his son Arlo, who's afraid of everything, to track down and kill a critter through rough, rocky terrain next to a river in the middle of a storm. A farmer who has lived next to a river that long should know that it will flood when it storms, and the rocks will become slippery, and the ground will turn to mud. But he only stops the hunt and decides to turn back after Arlo gets injured, and it's already too late. Of course, the river floods, and Henry dies as a result of his actions, which I suppose is sad, but this is no Mufasa we're talking about. This one scene really bugs me. And while it's not very long, it's the inciting incident for the rest of the plot to happen, and it's built on a really bad and out-of-character decision. As I said earlier, the film makes no attempts to do anything with its prehistoric setting, so the film quickly devolves into a generic Old West story about a young boy learning to overcome his fear of the entire world. I suppose I should also mention that this movie, as well as Brave, had extremely troubled development cycles, which partially explains why the finished products are of such low quality. But this doesn't mean we're giving them any leeway. We judge movies based on how they are, not how they could have been. Of course, everybody compliments the visuals of this movie, and rightfully so, but that's pretty much all this movie's good for, so it may as well be an animation reel instead of a movie. And number 21 is Cars 3. While not as absolutely atrocious as Cars 2, the third movie in Pixar's most mediocre series is definitely not good. Cars 3 completely ditches all the spy nonsense and pretends the previous film didn't happen in order to give us a return to form with a racing plot. Only this time, Lightning McQueen is apparently too old to be competing at any high level and nearly kills himself during a race. This movie tries to set a parallel between McQueen and Doc Hudson, who endured a similar accident, and that's sadly one of the only worthwhile ideas in the movie. Cars 3 goes out of its way to humiliate Lightning in every scene, well the only reason being that he wants to race at the top level despite not being as young as before. In Cars 1, Lightning was humiliated by the townsfolk because he refused to take responsibility for his actions, but he hasn't done anything to deserve the treatment he gets from Cruz and Sterling. Speaking of which, there was actually a scrap ending where Sterling monitors all their training sessions and determines that Cruz is faster than McQueen and subs in Cruz as his racer, leaving McQueen to switch companies to Dynaco and compete under Doc Hudson's number. That is way more coherent than the ending we got, which made absolutely no sense. In the actual movie, Lightning leaves in the middle of the race to give Cruz his number so she can finish the race. First of all, if car races are like the equivalent to foot races in this universe, why is subbing in a new racer even allowed? Secondly, the movie spends an inordinate amount of time explaining that new generation Jackson Storm is scientifically designed to be the perfect racer, and he literally dusts Lightning in the entire roster every race, so the fact that Cruz beats him is kind of insane. Cars 3 also tries to have its cake and eat it too, as it can't decide whether or not it wants Lightning to retire and train new racers or keep pursuing racing despite it practically being a lost cause. There are some nice moments, like the tribute to Paul Newman, the voice of Doc Hudson, who passed away in 2008. But other than that, I got next to nothing out of watching this movie. Alright folks, we got a string of subpar sequels coming up. 
At number 20, we have Toy Story 4. I feel like we're gonna get some pushback for this one because Toy Story 4 was surprisingly well received, and frankly, I have no idea why. This movie felt like it was written by people who hated the previous movies because it contradicts everything that Woody learns in Toy Story 1, 2, and 3. First, the movie opens up with a complete retcon of Bo Peep's character. In previous movies, she was never an action-centric leader. She was calm and level-headed, in contrast to Woody's extremely high-strung personality. It's such a baffling change, which was made so that there could be an adventurous female lead in the movie. Why would they not give this role to Jessie, who would be a much better fit? In fact, all the previous characters are completely sidelined here, so that we can follow the adventures of a suicidal plastic fork. Now, let's talk about another cardinal sin which sequels commit, and that is turning previously established characters incompetent to make new characters seem better by comparison. Woody and Buzz are both turned into idiots who can't advance the plot in any meaningful way and routinely mess up their own plans through sheer stupidity, all so that Bo Peep can be given more of the glory. TS4 also chucks all attempts at stealth and planning out the window, as toys frequently walk around out in the open, clearly visible to lots of nearby people, with Buzz at one point even yelling, your backpack's at the antique store, while Bonnie's mom is literally holding him in her hand. Your backpack's at the antique store. That's just lazy writing. The villain of this movie, in-universe, wants to steal one of Woody's internal organs for herself, kidnaps Forky to use him as ransom for this purpose, and then she is rewarded for her behavior at the end of the movie, completely undeserved. And <laughs> man, that ending sucks. The first problem is that Woody decides to leave on the account of Bonnie not playing with him for a week, which makes Woody seem needy and pathetic. And it's contradicted by the fact that Bonnie literally plays with him and Forky in the middle of the movie. Second, Woody becoming a lost toy is so contrary to his arc in both Toy Story 2 and 3, which both state that not only does Woody believe that being loved by a kid is worthwhile, no matter how much he's played with, but he also will never give up on his kids and will always be there when they need him. I can certainly compliment the stunning visuals on everything from the characters to the environments, as well as the inclusion of Key and Peele, even if they're underutilized. But it's safe to say I didn't enjoy my time with this one, as I feel this movie botched the ending of the Toy Story franchise. At number 19 is The Incredibles 2. To follow up the first Incredibles movie with something equally spectacular is an extremely difficult task, which shows by the fact that this film was very… Uh, meh. Without a doubt, the component of the movie that performs the worst as a sequel is the villain. Evelyn is a downgrade from Syndrome in every possible way, from her plan, to her origin, to her motivation. Her backstory is built on an extremely contrived circumstance, where her father gets killed during a home invasion in which she tried to call one of his superhero friends to rescue him, rather than run to the safe room. One, why is there not a phone in the safe room? And two, unless Gazer Beam was literally parked outside of his house, why would he expect any of the supers to get there faster than, like, the police? Besides that, Evelyn's plan is so backwards and counterintuitive. In a time when superheroes are illegal, she wants to give superheroes a ton of positive PR so that they'll become legal again, so that she can make them become illegal again, when all she probably would have had to do was put Elastigirl into a situation that made her look bad to the public. The screen slaver was actually an interesting concept for a villain, but that entire speech she gives while Elastigirl is trying to track her puppet down across the city is wasted because the writers wanted a twist villain. Take it from Disney, twist villains aren't necessary in every story. Mr. Incredible, who previously learned that being a good husband and father is more important than personal glory, fails at basic parenting throughout the entire movie and is severely depowered on the super side of things. Seriously. He can stop a moving train with his body, but can't break through some mangled pipes on a cruise ship. It also seems out of character for him to be more jealous of his wife than worried for her while she's working to take down a supervillain alone. I've got to succeed so she can succeed. Dash is given nothing to do. Violet, who spent the last movie breaking out of her timid shell, goes completely nuts that the boy she liked forgot she existed and spends most of the movie freaking out about it. And Jack-Jack is really just a plot device. Elastigirl, Frozone, and Edna come out mostly unscathed in terms of character, and Frozone going to protect the par kids from the hypnotized supers, as well as the Jack-Jack and Edna subplot are some of the highlights of the movie. But otherwise, this one is a far cry from the original and a real disappointment. At number 18 is Finding Dory. 
You'll notice a pattern with all these disappointing sequels is that none of them really needed to be made. While I do think Dory's past had some potential for an interesting story, like the previous entries, this one is simply a downgrade from the original. With Finding Nemo, you have the entire ocean as your setting. Finding Dory limits that area to one aquarium for most of the film, and everything feels very confined. Granted, one would expect to see a lot of different types of sea creatures in an aquarium, but the ones we see aren't nearly as interesting as the other characters introduced in the last movie, with the exception of Hank the Septipus, who actually has a fulfilling arc. In Finding Nemo, Marlin learns to trust Dory's judgment in spite of her memory issues, because she is very intelligent and empathetic, while he is extremely anxious and impatient. In this one, Dory makes an extremely unwise decision that causes Marlin to forget what he learned in the past movie and drive her away with an angry comment, leading to Dory's capture and the subsequent plot to rescue her. Once again, it's similar to the last movie, except that it's forced and out of character. It's also stupidly convenient that Dory's memories of her parents are triggered because she hears people say relatively common phrases like, there's no other way, as if she's never heard someone say that before. And this happens over and over again to advance the plot. Overall, this movie isn't terrible. As I mentioned earlier, Hank is a standout character who has some development, acts as a good foil for Dory, and has some funny moments. And Dory's reunion with her parents is also very sweet. Nemo and Marlin, however, have a much more contrived and less interesting B-plot, in which Marlin learns the exact same things he learned the last time around. And that stupid truck scene at the end took a lot of people completely out of the movie because of how ridiculous it was. Remember how the climax of the last movie was extremely relevant to the characters being fish? This just didn't know what it was going for, but as I said, not the worst sequel. Number 17 is Onward. Nature, magic versus modern technology is a fairly common theme for fantasy movies, and that's integrated as a pretty big part of the plot. Unfortunately, my biggest criticism for this movie comes from the world building because I don't think they put enough effort into explaining how magic just faded from everyone's memory except for Wilden Lightfoot. Technology makes things easier for the common man, but there's stuff that the magic in this movie can do that would be useful and necessary. For instance, at one point, Barley and Ian try to increase the size of a gas can, meaning they can literally duplicate natural resources. There is no universe where that wouldn't be useful enough for people to keep learning. Magic like this should be taught in schools, or at least a part of history class. As for the story, it incorporates a fantastical journey across enchanted lands, juxtaposed with normal life in modern-day cities just like ours, and I think that's neat. Barley is the standout character with tons of charm and nerdy enthusiasm, while Ian is relatable, but kind of flat, and I was honestly surprised at how much personality they were able to give a severed pair of legs. The bond between Ian and Barley is sweet, and they sell it really well, but I don't feel like the final payoff showing Barley being Ian's father figure instead of their dad was built up really at all throughout the film. Alright, this is also minor, but I can't watch this movie without thinking that Star-Lord is talking to Spider-Man about magic spells. I'd say Chris Pratt was miscast for the role of Barley, even if he gave a good performance, all things considered. Unfortunately, the impression I got after watching this movie was that it was unimpressive. It just didn't really hit any of the writing or emotional high points that we've come to expect from Pixar. Onward is an average movie that's worth a watch, but probably just one. And number 16 is the only Cars movie that doesn't suck, Cars. Don't confuse that intro with us saying that Cars is terrific because it ain't, man. In fact, a lot of people remember this one as the film that broke Pixar's perfect record because of all the amazing films that came before and after it. There aren't a lot of good standout writing moments for most of the film. All I can really point to is the back and forth between Lightning and Doc Hudson, and Lightning's whole character arc is pretty good too. The story of Radiator Springs, once a bustling and thriving hotspot being turned into essentially a desolate ghost town, is actually sad, even if the characters aren't particularly interesting. The ending scene where Lightning gives up first place to help the king cross the finish line is also great. Other than that, this movie has a generic plot with very stock characters. Alright, I wanted to wait until this point to make this criticism, which is that the Cars movies feel like they were exclusively made for selling toys. 
it's clear that is where the money is for this franchise, and it really seems like they put more time and effort into merchandise than they put into making their movies good. This is the movie where cars feel the most like cars, but as I said earlier, there isn't much that can come out of this concept without practically turning the cars into humans for more story potential. The first Cars is passable, but I don't think hating it is unreasonable, given the fact that it kickstarted Pixar's worst franchise to date. Alright, good news guys. We got out of the bad movies, that was tough. Alright, let's talk about some good ones. Number 15, Monsters University. I don't know if overhated or underrated is the proper term to describe this film, but a lot of the time, this one ranks near the bottom of most people's Pixar list. I can understand complaints about the pacing and how generic and uninteresting the entire college scare games plotline is, but there is legitimately some solid character work to be found in this film. Mike's backstory as an enthusiastic fan of scarers was really cool. The rivalry between the very studious and hardworking Mike and the naturally talented Sully was also fun, and it built up a solid conflict that eventually blossomed into a reluctant partnership, despite the huge egos of both characters. Unfortunately, I can't say the same for the other characters of Uzma Kappa, or the ones in Roar Omega Roar, as they're pretty bland and forgettable. But where this movie really shines is in the third act, when Mike enters the human world in an attempt to prove that he can be a scarer, causing Sully to chase after him. Their conversation out by the lake, followed by the biggest scare ever pulled, are two of the greatest moments in any Pixar movie for sheer character depth. It's just kind of a shame that the rest of the movie doesn't come anywhere close to the heights of those scenes. If they could have made the other characters a bit more interesting, this would have been more than a mid-tier film. But not everything works out that way, unfortunately. At number 14 is Pixar's newest release, Luca. Luca deviates from most Pixar movies in that the setup and plot are very simple. Two sea creature boys from different walks of life can transform into humans on land. They meet each other, and they decide their dream is to ride a Vespa. So they enter a competition with a local girl to win one, while having to hide their true identity. There isn't a lot to screw up in a story like this, and I appreciate the simplicity. The transformation aspect is easy enough to understand. As long as the boys don't get wet, they look like normal humans. Sometimes the movie likes to play fast and loose with the rules, such as when Alberto is running through the rain with an umbrella, even though his bare feet should still be getting wet from the ground and turning in the fins before he even reaches Luca. Also, what happens when they drink water? Do their lungs turn to gills and they suffocate? Whatever, just weird questions I have. There is a really nice dynamic between Luca and Alberto, as well as between Gilia and the two boys later on. Julia's dad Massimo is a really interesting character that I wish we got to see more of, and I really liked his rapport with Alberto in particular. The villain Ercoli is mostly a standard playground bully, although I was surprised at some points when it seemed like he was genuinely willing to kill our protagonist, sea monsters or not. The side plot with Luca's parents is pretty dumb, considering that they were willing to expose his identity as a sea monster in order to find him, which is dangerous given that the town doesn't even know if they're real yet, and confirming their existence is just going to lead to more people hunting them. It is refreshing to have a simple, slightly more grounded story this time around. But that also means that Luca doesn't have as many opportunities to reach the highs of the other Pixar films. Number 13 is going to Inside Out. I'm conflicted with this one, because I genuinely believe it's overrated, but it also has some very well-placed emotional moments, and once again, that's not a pun. Joy has a good arc, but damn did I find her to be annoyingly controlling for a good part of the movie. I get that the point of the film was for her to learn the value of sadness as a way of empathizing with others and expressing negative emotions in a healthy way, so I won't knock that part of the movie too hard. Bing Bong, while not really that interesting of a character, did have an admittedly sad death, and it's one of the better self-sacrifice scenes in Pixar's lineup. I think there are like two others, but still. The entire mindscape is pretty cool, and I like how they play around with different concepts of imagination and the functions inside people's brains. However, something that's always bugged me is people's obsession with how good of a character Riley is. I find this confusing because Riley isn't a character. What I mean by that is the emotions in her head dictate her choices, so she herself is never making anything happen or driving the plot forward. The emotions are the characters with actual agency over what they do, not Riley. That ending scene where sadness takes over and Riley talks to her parents is touching, only because of what it represents, not really for any in-universe reasons. And yes, 
the standard plot contrivances still apply. Why does Sadness suddenly decide to start messing with the core memories while Riley was in the middle of talking to her class? Why did Joy and Sadness not send the core memories back to HQ when they can literally do it at any time they're around the giant columns of memories? Why did Riley's personality island conveniently collapse at the very moment Joy was about to reach HQ on the train of thought? Like I said, I think this one is pretty overrated. I get why a lot of people really enjoy this movie, but top 10? That's doubtful. Next is A Bug's Life. Following up the success of Toy Story was going to be an extremely tall task, and Pixar's second release turned out to be an impressive sophomore release. But man, those visuals, man, they did not age well. If you actually pay attention to the backgrounds in the Ant Hill and City scenes, you can see how absolutely robotic and unnatural the character animations are. They try to hide this by having a lot of things happening at one time, but it's noticeable when you compare it to other movies that came out not too long after it. That being said, I'm actually impressed at how they were able to make the Ant's character models unique enough to differentiate every important character. Speaking of which, I think the characters in this movie range from just okay to great. Flick is a sympathetic, pure-hearted protagonist with lots of good ideas but often poor execution, who we still want to see succeed in the overall story. Princess Ada is fine, but I wish we could have gotten more references to the colony being uncertain about her becoming queen because that's almost her entire character conflict and is practically absent from the film. I still find the Circus Bug crew really funny, even if only a few of them stand out that much. But of course, the star of the show here is Hopper, who is intimidating and uses that to his every advantage to keep the ants in line. My biggest complaint is that the ending of the second act is really stupid and makes the climax seem really forced. After finding out that the bugs are circus performers, the queen, for some reason, decides to call off the entire plan involving the fake bird and exiles Flick for lying to them. But why though? Just because they aren't warrior bugs doesn't mean the bird plan can't work. The only reason this happens is so that Flick can become depressed and then have a dramatic return when it seems all is lost. A Bug's Life, in many ways, has aged better than I initially thought, <laughs> except those visuals, but it's still definitely the weakest movie of Pixar's classic lineup, besides Cars. Last stop before we hit the top 10, number 11 is going to Soul. I was impressed with what Soul managed to accomplish in terms of its messaging about what we believe our purpose is to be in truly living one's life to its fullest. There are plenty of legitimately well-crafted scenes that connect to the central ideas of the movie well such as 22 talking to everyone in the barbershop, 22 and Joy talking to his mother, or Dorothy's final words to Joe. There's also the time Joe plays the piano, or the other time Joe plays the piano, or the other other time Joe plays the piano. You get the point. It's a very dialogue and piano-centric film. The soundtrack to this movie is really unique, but I honestly ended up enjoying the atmospheric electronic music of the Soul Dimension more than the jazzy parts. In terms of lead duos, I think Joe and 22 have a great dynamic that is probably up there in that ranking, probably above Joy and Sadness, but not quite as high as a pairing like Buzz and Woody. Unfortunately, the plot doesn't hold up as well as it should. For starters, Joe's body comes back from the dead, with 22 essentially reanimating it, but she's not suffering from broken bones or head trauma or any pain at all, which is weird since Joe recently died. Secondly, the way that the writers facilitate certain scenes is sometimes really contrived, such as Joe messing up cutting his own hair so that we can have the barbershop scene, even though his hair is always covered by a hat and he doesn't need to cut it. I mean, his soul wears a hat. All I'm saying is that none of this would have happened if souls could taste pizza, just like they can see and hear for some reason. Looking past all of that, I still certainly recommend watching this. I will add the caveat that this is one of Pixar's more mature movies that I don't think should be shown to very young kids. This movie's like Inside Out, but better. As we move into the 10 greatest Pixar movies, we're entering into the territory of classic films that are and will likely be beloved by millions for years to come. This is also the point where the movies are becoming really hard to rank. 10th place is going to Up. We, of course, have to commend Up for giving us likely the most emotional and hard-hitting opening 10 minutes of any Pixar film. There is a drop in the film's overall quality after that, but how big of a drop is really the question. Personally, I find the rest of the film to be very entertaining, and the emotional moments between Carl and Russell are some of Pixar's best, like the scene where Russell talks about not knowing any camping stuff because he doesn't see his dad very often. 
but I agree that there is a bit of a disconnect between the extremely heartfelt, down-to-earth opening and the subsequent goofy adventures of an old man and a boy scout carrying a floating house with a giant rainbow bird following them and being chased by talking dogs piloting airplanes. Side note, the fact that the storm carries Carl's house to a completely different continent in such a short amount of time is one of the most contrived things in a Pixar movie. Doug is one of people's favorite aspects of this movie, and I certainly think he's funny and endearing, but he isn't the world's best sidekick or anything like that in terms of his character depth. My name is Doug. That being said, the core cast is still solid all around, and Doug is a part of that. I also really didn't care for the whole mount-functioning voice module thing going on with Alpha. He's an antagonist for a much larger portion of the movie than Charles Muntz is, and I would have preferred he was actually intimidating. Speaking of Muntz, for a villain, he I and decently intimidating once we find out that he killed other explorers who came looking for the same bird as him, but he's gotta be like 120 years old by now, right? I already said how much Carl and Russell shine, but Carl himself and the fact that he connects Ellie with their house is really well explored. When he finally lets the house go, representing him completing his adventure and letting go of the past, followed by the Ellie bash scene, is one of Pixar's better story wrap-ups to both the plot and Carl's character arc. Also, rest in peace to the voice of Carl, Ed Asner, who died this August. At number 9 is Coco. Alright, kudos to this movie for having an actually good child protagonist who isn't completely annoying, selfish, or stupid. While Miguel does have a journey to go through involving the importance of family, his motivation is still understandable because his family restricts him from doing what he loves simply because they believe that's how they should all live, not because music takes away from his responsibilities or something like that. I really enjoyed Miguel's family members like Imelda, Coco, and even Miguel's father for the little screen time he has, and I was very invested in the relationships and conflicts between the characters. However, the twist of Ernesto being the villain and Hector being Miguel's ancestor was predictable. Even without the incredibly obvious foreshadowing of the close-up on the shot glasses before Miguel gets to Ernesto's party. Also, how Ernesto wouldn't have heard himself echoing through an entire freaking stadium while admitting to his evil actions is such a stupid way to achieve victory. But even with Ernesto being a really lame villain, Coco is easily the best thing to come out of Pixar Studios in the past 10 years. It has some of the most impressive environments and set pieces Pixar has ever animated in The Land of the Dead, it has some of the most hard-hitting emotional beats in Pixar's catalog during the third act, and all in all, it's a nice celebration of Mexican culture. But if there's one part I think should receive praise above all for this movie, it's the amazing soundtrack. While it isn't a musical, Coco is a movie that's largely about music, and there are a ton of extremely memorable tunes sprinkled throughout this film, which lend themselves to really great emotional scenes. The cherry on top is the effort that they put into animating the actual guitar playing, which is extremely accurate to real life. Also, unpopular opinion, but the ending song, Proud of Corazon, is the best song in the movie. Yes, better than Hector's Remember Me. What's that? The Book of Life? Never heard of it. Number 8 is Finding Nemo. Would you believe this movie has probably the darkest opening of any Pixar film? Essentially, we start off with a man's entire family being eaten by a monster, save for one of his children. From then on, Marlin becomes a paranoid, nervous wreck at the slightest sign of anything remotely dangerous happening to his son. But at least it makes sense due to his previous experiences. I've heard a lot of people express hate for Nemo, at least at the beginning of the movie because of how he acts towards his father at the drop-off. But once again, I think this behavior makes sense given their dynamic. Marlin is an overprotective helicopter parent, and Nemo has been given next to no independence his entire life up until he goes to school. Of course, we really don't see the two interact for most of the film because of its premise, so let's talk about this mission to find Nemo. The ocean is one of the best settings to tell this story because the possibilities are practically limitless with the environments and the kinds of creatures that live there. The ocean is a beautiful natural wonder, but it can also be a dark abyss filled with terrifying monsters. Point being, there's a ton of creative potential. Unlike some garbage DreamWorks movies that came out a year later, Nemo actually uses its premise quite well and flips a lot of the deep sea tropes on their heads. The sharks run AA-type meetings to try and clean themselves up and not be mindless eating machines. The sea turtles are surfer dudes riding currents instead of waves, and the climax has a ton of fish working collectively as one unit to break free of a net. The main cast is rather small, but pretty much everyone has a great arc pertaining to the story. I also want to praise the likable and memorable side characters we meet along the way. 
as they're some of the best parts of the entire movie, and I'm partially highlighting this point to show where Finding Dory kinda went wrong. As for the animation, I think this is the film that allowed Pixar to show off the most during its early days. Every moving part is so perfectly fluid and feels legitimately alive, so it's definitely worthy of high praise. This is a truly great parenting story about a father willing to brave all the dangers of the world to rescue his son. Surprisingly, I don't got a lot of complaints. I guess it's convenient that Bruce takes Marlin and Dory to the exact spot that the diver goggles fell. Besides that, I can't think of anything else. At number 7 is what many people consider Pixar's most underrated film, Ratatouille. There are so many crazy ideas built into the premise that a rat wanting to cook food is probably the least crazy of all of them. You don't have to be a gourmet chef to understand Remy's passion for cooking, as it's delivered to the audience in a way that shows off Pixar's artistic chops. However, the rest of his rat family has difficulty understanding his very human-like impulses, and his father especially writes him off as a delusional dreamer. Remy then forms an unlikely partnership with a clumsy but sympathetic nobody by the name of Alfredo Linguini. I love Linguini and never wanted anything but success for him because of how pitiful he is, and he's got an amazing dynamic with Remy despite not being able to talk to each other. This movie also has some of the funniest physical comedy in Pixar's lineup, in large part due to the very fluid character animation of Linguini in particular. The rest of the cooking staff, while not given very much screen time, are still memorable, and anyone who's worked in a kitchen, high-end or not, can verify that the depiction of the people and events who compile a cooking unit like that are fairly accurate. Skinner isn't exactly the most compelling villain in the Hall of Infamy, but his paranoia about seeing the rat and about Linguini's abilities are honestly hilarious, and I think he's perfectly suited to the self-aware silliness of this film. Also, he literally gets Linguini drunk to try and make him confess his secrets. Of course, we all know that Anton Ego is the better antagonist, even if he's more of a neutral entity in the grand scheme of things. With the entire world thinking he couldn't do it, Remy completely dazzles the world's toughest food critic. And of course, Ego's speech perfectly captures the movie's central themes, and is truly one of the best monologues in film history. At points, Remy himself is pretty self-indulgent and full of himself, and it honestly takes a while to really enjoy his character, but the script is flipped as Linguini becomes the one taking all the credit for Remy's accomplishments, so the two of them have their ups and downs. All in all, I have to call this one like it is. A silly, ridiculous concept turned into a masterpiece about following one's passions and staying true to oneself in the face of adversity. Number 6 is going to the original Toy Story. Now I think this one is going to be controversial because this is a lot of people's pick for number one, and I can certainly see why. This was the one that started it all, the one that revolutionized 3D animated movies, and the one that made a lot of people's childhoods. However, as an adult, you start to notice and question more things about this world of toys. Why does Buzz not know that he's a toy, but also knows to act like one when there are people around? How long have these toys been alive? Woody mentions breaking the rules at one point, but we're going to have to break a few rules. What are those rules and who sets them? I mean, there's a toy mafia who punishes toy rule breakers? Of course not. Not all these questions need to be answered for this particular story to function, but this really becomes confusing if every single toy in existence is alive and no one notices it yet, especially if it's typical for toys to just go out on adventures or to not know their toys. This is a really interesting concept for a story that I'm sure helped a lot of kids' imaginations run wild and taught them to not mistreat their toys for fear of retaliation. World building issues aside, let's talk about the core of this film, which is the dynamic duo themselves, Woody and Buzz Lightyear. As two of the most iconic characters in animation, you can bet they have everything you might want in a main character duo. The two of them both go through solid character changes. Woody trying to drill into Buzz's head that he's a toy is honestly hilarious, and while relatable isn't really the right word, they're certainly both sympathetic. Well, eventually, Woody is sympathetic because he definitely learns to not be jealous of other toys getting played with more than him. A part of this series that I've always enjoyed is the stealth and misdirection. Obviously, they can't let the secret out, so the toys have to spend most of their time sneaking around and remaining inconspicuous when people are around. They at least have the benefit of kids not being very observant, and while it's far from perfect, I think this movie put decent enough effort into showing how toys slip by unseen most of the time. You know, up until the ending. Speaking of which, Sid probably suffers the worst fate of any Toy Story antagonist, essentially being traumatized for life. 
and I don't think he deserved it, since there was no way for him to know that the toys are alive. Side note, looking back at this character animation, especially for the human characters, it's aged pretty poorly. But hey, for a first-of-its-kind film, it's remarkable. This is one I think everyone should watch, if only to see the inception of 3D animated feature films. We certainly owe a lot to Toy Story. On to the top five. In fifth place is Toy Story 2. A really cool opening scene that is permanently ingrained in my memory starts off this new adventure as we see how Buzz Lightyear probably viewed himself in the first film. We also see the remarkable upgrade in the animation of the characters and environments from Toy Story 1. Truly, some of the strongest character work in the franchise is given to us by this movie, as Bud and Woody grapple over what they both taught each other from the previous adventure. Woody also must decide between staying around for Andy's fading childhood or being immortalized and adored by children from behind a glass case for years to come. Jesse's sequence with remembering Emily is also heartbreaking and makes a convincing argument for Woody to leave Andy behind but ultimately, he makes the right decision, solidifying the fact that Woody would not leave his kid or his friends. Stinky Pete is a decent villain revealed with an effective twist, once again proving that Pixar is better at making twist villains than Disney, but I feel like his compelling backstory as a forgotten and overlooked toy was a bit underutilized. This movie also improves upon the sneaking aspect in the first film, as the toys have to make moves in increasingly public settings as well as in broad daylight. Although, it is kind of weird that the toys get away with causing a massive car pileup on a four-lane freeway without anyone noticing the moving traffic codes. That finale is also very climactic, but Bullseye keeping up with a jet that's literally about to take off is freaking nonsense. I mean, a real horse wouldn't be able to do that. Overall, that stuff isn't why we love this one so much. The real reason that Toy Story 2 lands this high because of the characters, old and new, each offering up their perspectives on the role of toys and coming to the conclusion that toys are meant to be there for their kids when they're needed. This is an improvement in pretty much every way on the already fantastic original film. I would also recommend looking into this film's extremely troubled development history, as it's a really interesting story and also goes to show just how important this movie is to Pixar, because it pretty much saved the studio from being canned by Disney. Number 4 is Monsters, Inc. Once again, this is a film that makes excellent use of its world and its concept with an extremely creative spin on the idea of the monster in your closet. This also becomes hilarious when you realize that Monster is just working his 9 to 5 and is trying to get this whole thing over with so he can just go on his lunch break. Speaking of which, there's one thing that elevates Monsters, Inc. to this position. It's the comedy. In my mind, this is undoubtedly the funniest Pixar movie, with Billy Crystal giving a great performance and delivering some of the best one-liners that will make both kids and adults laugh. This may be a bold declaration, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that Mike and Sully are the best Pixar duo. Yeah, better than Buzz and Woody. This is because there really is no straight man between the two of them, and they're pretty much on the same level. While Sully could be considered the more serious one, Mike is just as smart and often has more common sense. This makes it that much more believable that Mike becomes enraged at Sully for not listening to him when the two get banished. The animation is extremely ambitious and impressive for the time. Although not everything has aged the best, particularly when the duo gets banished to the Himalayas, which looks very much like a PlayStation 2 cutscene. Also, does the company of Monsters, Inc. just rule the world or something? I don't know if I'd ever want to work for a company that is legally allowed to throw me into a different realm if I screw up. Mr. Waternoose is a pretty good twist villain, whose motivation goes beyond simply greed or power, as he seems to actually care about his company and dealing with the energy crisis. However, I've always found Randall to be the more intimidating of the two, and a better challenge for our heroes to have to deal with. That chase scene through the door storage facility is thrilling and brilliantly animated, but something that's always bothered me is that there looks to be literally millions of doors all activated at the same time and not one of them gets open from the human world during that entire scene? Also, why has Disney World not created a Monsters, Inc. door factory roller coaster yet? Overall, this one is an absolute gem, and a stroke of genius in everything from the concept to the characters to the casting. Truly an all-time classic. The third greatest Pixar movie of all time is Toy Story 3. I've heard the criticism that Toy Story 3 hits a lot of the same story beats as the second movie, and I can certainly see the similarities. But even with those present, I think Toy Story 3 holds up as a superior film, because it hits those beats even better. Just as Toy Story 2 was an absolute 
absolute improvement over the first. The stealth in this series is at its absolute highest level during the Escape from Sunnyside jailbreak scene, a suspenseful and smart take on that trope well implemented into the Toy Story universe, with each character making use of their individual skill sets to escape. Lotso is a star player. His nice, warm, plush exterior makes for a great twist once it's revealed that he's a cruel, heartless dictator inside all that stuffing. The way he abandons the other toys, even after they saved his life, shows his commitment to his selfish ways that led him down the dark path in the first place. He single-handedly elevates this movie to an even higher spot, but Toy Story 3 is near perfect even without him being the franchise's best villain because of all of its other aspects. Woody's journey in this movie is so enthralling and comes full circle with the previous two installments when he finally decides that his purpose with Andy has been fulfilled, and he switches attention to making sure his fellow toys get the ending that they deserve. Words cannot describe how good that final scene is with Andy, giving his toys to Bonnie and playing with them one last time. We couldn't have imagined a better emotional note to close with, and it delivers a perfect ending to the Toy Story series. Yep, a perfect ending because nothing else happened to the toys after this movie. <sighs> or at least I wish that's how it was. The race for the top spot was one of the toughest decisions we've ever had to make in our lives. But at number two is Wally. -E. This movie has one of the more depressing openings, and I don't mean sad like up, I mean depressing, like seeing the earth become a desolate wasteland ravaged by pollution. But in that depressing wasteland lies the earth's sole glimmer of hope, a curious little robot named Wally, who's fascinated by almost everything he finds, even the simplest piece of junk that we wouldn't give a second thought to. He's in for a rude awakening, though, when a massive spaceship makes its descent right outside Wally's house and reveals a much newer looking robot seemingly bent on exterminating him. It's kind of weird that Eve shoots everything that moves while looking for signs of life on Earth, but hey, maybe b &L were concerned about aliens or something. Despite all the plasma shots fired in his direction, Wally is still intrigued by her and strikes up a rapport after dodging some more blast. One of the greatest things this movie accomplishes is giving so much personality and spirit to these robots and making you see them as more human than the actual humans. The most impressive part is that most of this characterization is done almost entirely without dialogue, and the fact that this is really a love story between two robots at its core only adds to the layers of accomplishment that Pixar achieved with this movie. The humans receive less characterization than the bots, with the exception being the captain, who I find to be severely underrated. His curiosity and excitement about things which are familiar to us today but have clearly been lost in the future shows that the human spirit still endures on this vessel full of obese, screen-obsessed husk of people, not to take away credit from John and Mary as well. As an antagonist, Otto is not amazing but very serviceable in his role and still displays a level of cruelty in contrast to our hero's kindness, despite both running on artificial intelligence. Gotta say, it's pretty much impossible not to love Wally as an absolutely pure-hearted character with no ill intent whatsoever. Also, kudos to Pixar for adding an environmental message to the movie without having it to be preach your obnoxious. We can go on forever about specific scenes like Wally and Eve flying through space together or Eve reviving Wally after he's nearly crushed, but it's all still in service of the same point, that Wally is truly a masterpiece of visual storytelling. You can make a strong case for Wally to take the top spot, but I think there's one film that's just a smidge better. And finally, Number one, the title of the best Pixar movie of all time goes to The Incredibles. Man, what a film. Before Marvel had a stranglehold over the superhero market, The Incredibles was the best that we could ask for out of a movie like this. In my mind, this is one of the best, and honestly, most realistic takes on the superhero movie genre. Supers getting sued over collateral damage they cause on the job would absolutely happen, especially with the magnitude of destruction that happens in some of these movies looking at you, DCEU. But moreover, there are so many other different ideas and concepts explored in this movie. Bob works for a shady insurance company who screws customers over. Helen thinks that her husband is having an affair for a large portion of the movie. Syndrome literally commits a genocide against the world's superheroes and sells weapons to terrorists. When the hell did we stop making kids' films so intense? And why? 
In all honesty though, I can say with certainty that this is not a kid's film. With all I just mentioned, plus a lot of other plot points present in the movie, like Bob going through a midlife crisis, this movie is too jam-packed with adult-oriented concepts for kids to comprehend in their entirety. I didn't pick up on the whole story when I watched it as a kid, but I think we all come to appreciate movies like this when we re-watch them years later. It's difficult to find flaws in this film's writing. I guess if I could point to one, I'd say it's pretty crazy that Mr. Incredible winds up finding Gazer Beam's body, as well as Syndrome's computer password, by complete accident because Syndrome accidentally flung him in the general direction of it. Other than that, I really don't have anything to complain about, and this is just the plot. Every single character has a unique personality and journey of growth, which makes them so compelling, especially Bob though Helen, Dash, and Violet deserve a lot of credit as well. As for Frozone, there's no other word to describe him but iconic with all of his memorable dialogue, and we can say the exact same thing about Edna Mode. We cannot discuss this film without mentioning Syndrome, Pixar's greatest and most evil villain of all time. He's got the intimidation factor and malice that we look for in a bad guy. His plan actually makes sense. And his backstory, while a little predictable, informs his ideology very well. Combine all we just mentioned with some of the most intense and well-devised action scenes in Pixar history, a thrilling spy adventure, and climactic battles all around, and you've got the recipe for the greatest film in an extremely competitive lineup. For lack of a better descriptor, this film is absolutely incredible and worthy of the top spot on our list. And that, my friends, is a monster of a ranking. What do you think, guys? Did we keep a film too far down or did we hold one too high? Whatever opinions we may have, at least we can all agree that Pixar is capable of and hopefully will continue to make masterpieces for years to come. Make sure to hit that notification bell and most importantly, stay wicked.